Let us now turn our hearts and worship our God, and we'll be reading from Psalm 68 to begin, Psalm 68, verses 9 to 16. Psalm 68, 9 to 16, it says, Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home divided the, divided the spoil. Though ye have lied among the pots, yet, sh- yet, yet ye shall be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white as snow in Salmon. The hill of God is, a, is as the hill of Bashan, and high hill as the hill of Bashan. Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. Let us now sing unto the, God, unto the Lord, singing his praise, again from Psalm 68, and now 11 to 17. Psalm 68, 11 to 17. Uh, some of the same verses here. The tune is Glencairn, starting in verse 11. The Lord did, the Lord himself did give the word of the word, sorry, excuse me, the word, the word abroad did spread. Great was the company of them, the same who published it. And down to verse 17. God's chariots 20,000 are, thousands of angels strong. In his holy place God is, as Mount Sinai, them among. And so let us give praise to our God from Psalm 68, 11 to 17, and the tune is Glencairn. <clears throat>
now stand as we call upon the Lord God in prayer. O Father God in heaven, we confess unto thee how unworthy we are beside thy greatness and thy might, and how thou hast chosen, how thou hast chosen thy church. Lord, we confess it is beyond us to know because of all thy greatness and all of our weakness. And we pray that thou would forgive our sins. We pray that thou would heal us from uh, such iniquities as have plagued us and prevailed against us. And we pray that thou would do so even uh, by thy spirit and, and by thy word, affecting our, our souls, O Lord. We pray that thou would have much honor in thy church, that Christ would have great honor among thy people, and that thou, thou would uh, receive of us uh, worship that is acceptable in thy sight, because it's given uh, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray we would come rightly, and that we would put away uh, thoughts of other things and thoughts of, uh, thoughts of our, our regular lives. And we pray that we would, we would come near, and we pray that thou, God, would help us. Lord, bless thy people. Uh, give, unto us, give unto us good gifts, and we pray that we would, we would see wonderful things out of thy word. We pray that thou would uh, help in all parts and that thou would animate us even with thy spirit so we could give thee service which is, which is fitting to thee. Lord, we desire that thou would increase our faith and we desire that thou would, uh, that thou would increase our love for thee and our love for one another, that this would be pleasing in thy sight. Oh, help us, God, for we need thee. We do pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our consecutive reading of God's Word is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll be reading from verses 1 to the middle portion, uh, 1 to 17. Romans 8, 1 to 17. Now give ear to the word of the living God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the flesh, the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then that they, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Well, bringing what was said in chapter 7 to mind, uh, what was said in the previous chapter to mind about marriage and about being married uh, as somebody married to a law and then death to the law, a death taking place 
uh, and freeing us from that, that condemnation that, brings, uh, that, that the law brings about because of Christ's death. Now Paul is bringing it more into the practice of the believer in chapter 8. And he's bringing it more into the practice to show us that to be uh, carnally minded is death but to walk and to think and to reason according to the Spirit is life. Now, young people, sometimes you may wonder, why do my parents, why are they always on me about what do I I listen to? Or what do I read? Or what do I watch? Or what things do I look at on my phone or on the internet? Why are my parents always on to me about that? Well, this is why. This is why, because it says, the Word of God says to be carnally minded is to be dead. And that's not what your parents want for you. They do not want you influenced by all these things that would set your mind aflame with the things of the world. No, they want you to be spiritually minded. Now, your parents know that they can't make this happen themselves. Your parents know that they can't, uh, they can't pull the levers and pull the strings just so that you would be spiritually minded but it is a work of God, as we read in this, in this chapter. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So it's a work of God. It's a work of the Spirit that you would have your mind set upon the things of God and the things of the Spirit. But yet your parents love you, and they want to do everything they can to help you and to, and to give you uh, that opportunity and that, and that help so that you would be receptive to the Spirit of God in your life as, as you listen to the preaching and as you hear the Word of God read in your homes and as you, as you hear your parents pray that you would be receptive and, and your mind would not be polluted with so many things of this world. Paul says in verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And so again, young people, your parents are trying to help you and trying to train you for something that you're going to have to do the rest of your life, uh, your lives as a, as a believer. You're going to have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Your parents aren't always going to be with you. One day you're going to be uh, men and women on your own, without parents Always, always looking after you. And then who's going to have to decide, what will I look at? What will I read? What will I watch? What will I listen to? You'll have to do it. And so you'll need the Spirit of God, just like your parents need the Spirit of God, to not live after the flesh, not be inflamed by whatever the world loves so much, and to not be carried away as the world is carried away with their entertainments and their ungodly, ungodly things. But instead, to mortify the deeds of the body. That means to kill them. That means to say no to them until you strangle them to death. To say no to these, these sinful desires, things that do not please God. Be led by the Spirit of God, as, he, as we reread. Be led by the Spirit of God if you be uh, sons of God. And be animated by the Spirit of God uh, and energized by what we have in the Word of God, which feeds the spirit, which feeds the soul. And, be, and if, we, if we would live like this, the Spirit itself, we're told, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we would be putting away the deeds of the, of the flesh and mortifying the deeds of, of, of sin, the Spirit would... Bear witness with us, with our spirit, that we are the sons of God, that we do uh, even walk in a measure of, of victory with the Lord as we, as we seek to please him. And, and Paul ends with this, even if we suffer, even if we are persecuted, it's nothing that Christ hasn't, hasn't been through. It's nothing that, that Christ, our forerunner, hasn't already experienced. And so he says, if we're heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, well, we'll follow in his footsteps and we'll also be glorified with him, he says. And so even if there's a great cost, even if, if it means losing friends, even if it means your family, your own family, 
uh, not approving of you in some way. It could have a great cost, but we are told if we follow in his footsteps, if we are following after Christ, our forerunner, and suffering with him, then so also will, be, will we be glorified with him. Well, may the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts. Let us sing again to the Lord from our consecutive psalm, Psalm 133. Psalm 133. The whole psalm. And this is the tune, Newington. Psalm 133. It's a psalm for uh, peace and, and unity in the church. A song of degrees of David. Behold how good a thing it is, and how becoming well, together such as brethren are, in unity to dwell. And then we're told about Aaron and the ointment on his head that flows down his beard. It gladdens his heart. It gladdens the heart of God's people to be in unity to, together and to dwell as brethren. And then it's even as the dew of Hermon, as Hermon's dew, the dew that doth on Zion's hill descend. For there the blessing God commands, life that shall never end. And so it gladdened the people of Israel to see the dew descending from Mount Hermon, the snow melting and the, and the, the streams coming forth. It gladdened their heart because they knew that that was the promise of great increase in their fields. And they knew that that was the, the sign. Uh, it, would, it would be a, a good harvest. But we have a greater sign. We have a greater hope, don't we? Because we have a promise of life that shall never end. And we're cheered by, by uh, walking in this life together as brethren and cheered that we'll have life that will never end uh, when we see one another walking uh, together in, in truth. And so let us sing to the Lord's praise, Psalm 133, and the tune is Newington. Next reading is from Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. We'll read the entirety of the chapter and then we'll take a portion of this for our message. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, 
neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him in a a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the, where the, uh, the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Would you now stand as we go again to the Lord in prayer? O God, our Father in heaven, when we read such things, it makes uh, whatever is going on now seem of, of little consequence. But yet, Lord, we know that thou art at work in all things bringing about thine own ends, bringing about the, uh, the, the rise of the church, the security and safety of the church, and bringing about, uh, bringing about the, the advancement of the gospel. And Lord, we pray that thou would instruct us from these things and help us to know, uh, know what thou would reveal unto us about times to come. We pray that thou would bless us as we embark upon this and, and endeavor to uh, know from thy word whether thou would teach us from thy scriptures so that we would be ready, and that none would be caught off guard, but yet we would be understanding and ready, and doing the will of Christ, doing the work of the Master, until he come. We do ask all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Our message this afternoon is from Revelation 20, uh, verses 1, uh, 1 to 7. And the title of this message is, Deceived no more. We take up this portion of God's word seeking his blessing to understand something uh, deep. Seeking to understand something that has been misunderstood and, and some th- think it's not terribly important to understand. And some people think that it's all that we need to know about. Some people make a great deal of this subject. And of course we're talking about the nature of the thousand years, the nature of the millennium. What is it? What will it be like? Uh, What will happen before? What will happen during? And what will happen after? Now there are aspects here upon which all will agree, and there are others upon which uh, there will be some more uh, controversy and and some contesting. But what you'll hear from me is uh, fairly standard teaching from some of our covenanter forebearers, Uh, Some fairly uh, standard teaching from those that uh, came before, and I'll also be leaning upon some of uh, David Silversides for commentary also, and and James Durham. I hope that this message will clear some things up for some of you, because it's a common question among believers. What what do these things signify? What's going to happen? Uh, You hear the question asked uh, here and there, and and a number of times people, and, and people come with different assumptions. Uh, people think that, uh, that, that different things will happen in different places and times. And so let's, let's go to the scriptures. Let's say, what do the scriptures reveal? And let's clear some unbiblical views away. So boys and girls, millennium means 1,000 years. And we read here in Revelation 20 about a millennium, 
about Satan being bound. That's the first thing that happens. Satan cast into prison for a thousand years. And he, it says, it's said that he's not able to deceive the nations during that time as he once did. And then we read about saints, uh, the holy ones, those that are with Christ, and they reign along with him for this thousand years. And these are the, this is the same period of time. It's not a thousand years and then a thousand years. It's the same period of time. Uh, because we're also told at the end of it, it says at the, at the completion of it, that Satan is to be loosed for a, sh a short time. A little season, we're told, where he'll be loosed and enabled once again to deceive the nations just before the end of all things. Some, some are called uh, premillennial, uh, premillennialists. And they have a view of these things. They view that what was read is going to take place uh, in the sight of all after the Lord Jesus Christ returns bodily to the, to the earth. That Christ is going to return bodily to the earth, setting up a kingdom here on earth, and that we'll see these things come to pass. Uh, they even throw in, some of them even throw in something called a rapture, um, that there's going to be some tribulation, and that some who believe are going to be ex excused from that, and it, and it gets quite complicated. But I, I'll just say that there are numerous problems with this view. But one problem that looms very large in my eyes is this idea that Christ would come and set up an earthly kingdom, leaving his place where he is now of, of glorification. Why would he leave it? to come and to do these things on earth. We're told uh, in Scripture that Christ is currently at the right hand of, of authority of God interceding for us at all times. What advantage would it be then for us, for him to leave it, even if he were to come to set up a kingdom on earth? It, it would be uh, not an advantage for the church, for Christ to do that. He is in the place of greatest advantage for us right now as he is interceding before the, the throne of God for the church at all times. And, and another reason, another important problem, uh, I'll sum up here from uh, Pastor Silversides. He says that premillennialism proposes a, a glorified Christ and glorified saints in the midst of a fallen world and an unrenewed earth. The same glorified Christ who caused an unglorified John to fall at his feet as one who is dead, uh, Revelation 1.17. And so for Christ to dwell in a world where sin still exists unjudged and unpunished would involve a measure of humiliation for the Lord Jesus Christ that is unthinkable. Christ's humiliation is finished, and he is exalted at the right hand of God. There will be no humiliation again for the Redeemer. And when he comes, it will be to judge the world in righteousness and to put all contradiction of his sovereign, majestic claims eternally to an end. And so Pastor Silversides points out that were Christ to come, to come bodily, it's to judge sin, not to coincide, uh, not to coexist with opposition and enemies for a period of time as it's incrementally defeated, but to judge it once and for all because Christ has already been humiliated and now he is exalted on high. A very good point. Well, that's premillennialism, and that's uh, some issues I see with it. There's another view there, uh, another view out there called amillennialism, which sees the references to the 1,000 years as a non-specific thing. Uh, that that this, these things that we're reading of, they're communicating general things to us, general concepts about an entire period between Christ's resurrection and his coming again at the last judgment. And so that's why they're called amillennialists, because they don't uh, feel they need a, a clear answer to you know, a sequence of things and, and this happening and that happening. They don't feel they need it because they don't take these things as being uh, necessarily able to be put into uh, a neat and tidy scheme of this happening, this happening. They, they say it's just... It's just teaching. It's just communicating. It's just uh, giving guidance. And so they take a, a, more, uh, a more general understanding of it. And so I would, I would sum up uh, the way they, they view uh, the, this, this passage something like it's, 
uh, it's general. It's not something, it's, it's giving us a trajectory. We can take pieces from here and pieces from there, but what we, what we have is a trajectory of what's, what things are going to take place leading up to the, end, to the final days. Uh, as far as this thousand years, uh, many of them would say, we're in it now. We're in it right now. Uh, they'll also say that Satan was already bound and cast into prison uh, upon the, uh, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for this view, before my eyes, I would say that the little season of Satan, Satan's little season presents a, a, quite a problem for this view. Because for those who hold to amillennialism, you'd, you'd need to ask them if Christ bound Satan and, and he's completely bound right now, and he's in this prison that we are reading about, how is he going to get out of it? If that's something that Christ did with his death and resurrection, do we think that there's a way for that to be undone? If that's what Christ did at his resurrection, rather than it being something done in providence uh, through the ministry of the church in time. And so that's, that's one issue. And another issue is this. Uh, that for for the, the, this little season, well, those who hold to all millennialism, all millennialism uh, they acknowledge a sequence of sorts. They, they, they read the same Bible. They say that, okay, there, there will be a, a little season. And so they acknowledge some sort of a sequence as well. And so the question is, if you acknowledge some sequence, why don't you, you take it a little further and, and look at the, the other sequential things that we see happening uh, one after another. Th this is really uh, bringing us to uh, uh, really the, the position we're getting to, which is post-millennialism, and that's recognizing a sequence and recognizing that these things come one after another. So we have premillennialism, amillennialism. Uh, they overlook some of these things, as I've mentioned. So now I'd like to briefly describe uh, post-millennialism. I'll try to do this with many scripture passages. From the time of the prophets, the Lord's people, they heard about the great salvation that was coming for uh, God's people in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they heard about the suffering servant. They heard about the redeemer. They heard about the uh, work of redemption that God had in store. And this is, of course, all fulfilled in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at his first coming. But along with that, there are so many prophecies and psalms describing a time of great gospel prosperity, unlike anything that's been known already, where nations will willingly subject themselves to the Lord's governance. And, and just for a sampling, here are a few po uh, passages of, of this. Psalm 72. In his days, the righteous, uh, in his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have, have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. We also have Isaiah 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord, the Lord's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so a, a familiar passage speaking of a time of great prosperity of the gospel in the land. We also have Daniel 7. This is what Daniel says. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. It's almost a mirror image of what we read in Revelation. Uh, this horn being a reference to the Antichrist, uh, making war with the saints, prevailing against them until, until this period in which we're speaking of, judgment is given to the saints and to, of the Most High. 
and the saints possess the kingdom. We also have Micah 5. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, and as showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. So we're hearing of a time in which the saints of God will go forth, uh, go forth in power, and that's preaching, and that's teaching the nations to subject themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. And so we're hearing of a time where there's unprecedented uh, ob obedience and subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ in the earth. We also have Malachi 1. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. So we're told in Malachi, in every place, incense shall go forth, uh, speaking of the prayers of God's people, that in every place, there's going to be uh, the Lord's people offering that, that, that incense of prayer unto him, and his, his name, he says, will be great among the heathen. And then we have Psalm 45. Psalm 45 presents us with uh, one of the most beautiful uh, pictures of this time to come. It says, The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. And so we're told of a time in which the daughter, uh, the king's daughter, meaning the church, will be front and center. And all the nations shall look to her and rejoice and say, the church, this is the choice of the Lord. Uh, this is the Lord's uh, church, uh, the Lord's choice. And they will praise the Lord because of the church forever and ever in all places. Well, we could add on to that. We could multiply passages. But taking these combined with what we've already seen in Revelation 20, I would hope that what is emerging in your mind is this time of gospel prosperity, where there will be unprecedented gains in the church, where there will be uh, unity and peace in the church, and that nations will seek to honor Christ as nations. They will seek, they will say, I, I want to honor Christ by supporting and encouraging the church. And we could multiply passages on this. In fact, this time is likened to a second reign of King Solomon. Brethren, when Solomon reigned in Israel, he was far above all the kings of the earth. For wisdom, for might, for majesty, for glory, for excellence, he was far above them. When Christ rules from end to end of the earth... Through his gospel, Christ's glory and his majesty will make Solomon look like a little boy who's playing in a sandbox because of his majesty, because of his splendor and his dominion. This is our, this is our expectation. This is what we pray for, what we long for, for this time of gospel prosperity. And, and we would stop and ask ourselves, well, have we seen this all happening yet? I don't think so, brethren. We've seen a, a wonderful swelling of the church and, and, and an expansion of the church, but have we seen this happen? No, brethren. I, I would say no, because there are some things that are to happen before this time. And we're going to uh, get into that now. One thing that would happen before this time would be the Jews, the mass conversion of the Jews uh, coming into the church. This must happen. Uh, we read about this in Romans 11. We read in Romans 11 that a day is coming when the Jews will be grafted into the vine as natural branches that have been broken off. And Paul says of that day, he says, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be? 
but life from the dead. A wonderful uh, time of, of gospel prosperity when the Jews are converted uh, in mass and joining the church. This shall be a, a glorious day. And this does correspond with something we read in Revelation 20, where it says that Christ's reign, it, it, it talks about this period of, of Satan being bound, and it talks about this thousand years, and it, and it concludes it here in verse 5 when it says, this is the first resurrection. This is the first resurrection. Well, let's discuss what that means. Now, some have taken this part, this uh, first resurrection part in verse 5. Uh, the premillennialists and some dispensationalists have said, this is the rapture. This is some kind of a secret thing. This is uh, a mystery where there's going to be a partial resurrection, where some are going to be carried off and others are going to be left behind. It's a, it's a rapture, and, and so that's why it's called the first resurrection. But brethren, th this is not the case. This is actually a load of hogwash. This resurrection is not physical. We're only told in the scripture of one physical resurrection. We read of it in which the sea will cast forth its dead and the grave shall open up. This is only one physical resurrection. There's not two resurrections. There's one resurrection. So what we're reading of in, in verse 5 here is something other than physical. And the answer to it is something that we just saw in Romans 11. We do see a resurrection foretold in, in Romans 11 when Paul says, when the Jews are brought back into the church and when those natural branches are grafted back onto that vine, it will be life from the dead. That's a resurrection. It's speaking of the body of the Jews being resurrected by faith, not physical. And that's what kicks off and that's what's part of this thousand year reign would be the Jews uh, coming back to the church. This comports with what we see in the rest of Scripture, uh, this, this promise of the Jews coming to the church. Uh, in fact, here's also what Paul says in, in Romans 11. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And so we're told their, their fullness, they're receiving, uh, coming back into the church. How much more shall it be to the riches of the world? Well, it'll be... It'll be uh, great and without measure as we understand what's going to take place in this time of the millennium. And so we do pray with expectation for these things. We do pray that, that these things would come to pass and that the Antichrist would be defeated, even as we read in, in the, the book of Daniel, that this Antichrist would be uh, defeated once and for all and the Jews would be brought in. And so there would be this time like Solomon's rule on earth, but with Christ reigning by his gospel. So we pray for all of these things. Some have asked questions about the, the true length of time of, of these events. Is it a thousand years? That's what it says. Is it a thousand years or are we to make of this, uh, make this into a, a figurative thing, so, sort of like we were reading the Psalms, he, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, maybe it's uh, more figurative. Well, I'll just say I, I, I would not be surprised to find it's, it's really and truly a thousand years, as it says. But uh, not everything is, is made so clear. We, we do have to allow that uh, these things could have a figurative element to them. But brethren, for these things to happen, Satan must be bound. That's another thing that must happen. Uh, we read of this in Revelation 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain of the hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And this is that he should deceive the nations no more. And this brings us to our third heading if you're taking notes that he shall deceive the nations no more. The nations are deceived at this time. Make no mistake about it. Even though, as we've said, the church has made many leaps and bounds as, as far as growth and, and entrances into uh, places where it had not been known before, the nations are still being deceived actively because we do not see the things that, that we were uh, reading of earlier. We do not see Christ held in honor. 
from end to end of the earth. We do not see uh, Christ's commandments heeded upon the earth and upon uh, in different nations. We do not see Christ's church uh, prized among the nations. Instead, we see idolatry. And we see, uh, we see calling of evil good. And we see framing of, of mischief for a law. We see innocent blood spilled. And we see all these things. We see perversity that's celebrated across the face of the earth. And the list could go on. And these things are rampant. Even though the gospel has been preached and declared, even though people have heard the gospel, they continue in these things. Why? Because they are being deceived by Satan. Satan is deceiving uh, the nations. And he's, he's doing whatever he can that the gospel would not penetrate and that people would not be changed, they would not convert, and there, there would not be this, this uh, mass coming into the church. He's deceiving them. He's deceiving them with uh, false philosophies. So the gospel is being preached, and then Satan comes and his servants, they deceive. Uh, it started at the very beginning. Satan's servants came and they said, these Christians, well, they're, they're cannibals. These Christians, well, they, they reject all civil authority. And so, Christ, uh, so, so Satan is spreading lies about the church. And then from there, uh, other empty philosophies, uh, Gnosticism, Arianism, Docetism, Manichaeism. Uh, each of these lies, each of these seeking to undermine, seeking to chisel away at the true gospel. And then Satan's servants, they, they continue. Uh, we've seen this. They, they continue with vain philosophies, uh, enlightenment philosophies. Enlightenment philosophies uh, saying that, no, that knowledge of everything is right within man's reach. And that man can know all things. Man can do all things. Uh, man can a achieve all things through empiricism and through scientific study. And then Satan deceives the nations with existentialist philosophy in which he says uh, men are the masters of their own fate. There's no accountability above them. Men are the masters of their own fate. They can act as they will, and they can will themselves to great things and to power. And so he does it with existentialist philosophy. And then Satan's servants, they come with philosophies trying to uh, confuse and trying to distort people's minds. Uh, even as we had read earlier in, in uh, Romans 8, he, he sends these philosophies and these, these lies that people's minds will be twisted upon that which is carnal and focused upon that which is, which is unseemly. And then let's not leave out Satan's masterwork, the Roman Catholic Church. And in this way, Satan has deceived. And in this way, Satan has raised up this counterfeit alongside the true church in order to, to, to siphon off credibility, uh, siphon off power, uh, attempt to rob uh, true believers of their assurance through his masterwork, the Roman Catholic Church. Well, we could spend hours on, on this and how Satan has lied and deceived the nations. He's done it with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he has caused the Roman Catholic Church to bless those who do evil. He's caused the Roman Catholic Church to uh, protect people in their idolatry uh, through syncretism. He's caused the Roman Catholic Church to extort uh, wealth beyond measure from all sorts of nations uh, caused the Roman Catholic Church to uh, lash out at princes who would dare, dare, dare question uh, the ambition of the, of the Antichrist. And so he's, uh, Satan's been, been deceiving in these things. But brethren, think about what it will be when he's bound. Think about how it will be when, when this takes place and Satan is bound, as the scripture says, and he deceives the nations no more. His, his influence will be, uh, will be brought to nothing. When Satan can no longer deceive the nations, it, it will be as though men everywhere will come awake after being, uh, being asleep or become sober after being drunk. And all these empty philosophies that we've discussed, they'll all be exposed They'll all uh, just be, be shown to be empty and to be held up by nothing. And when that happens, men will, will clamor to hear the preaching of the gospel. 
And they'll come from every corner and they'll, they'll lay hold upon ministers and they'll say, preach the gospel to us. Teach us of the Lord's ways. Uh, so long have we been in darkness. Teach us of the Lord's ways. And they'll, they'll be rulers and they'll be kings and they'll beg for gospel ministers to preach and to teach the people. And they'll say, teach the people. Let them know all that the Lord has said. And rulers will devote themselves to studying the word of God from cover to cover. And they'll learn the law of God and they'll judge by the law of God. And in those times, so many will be rushing into the church across the entire earth. Children, in those times, so many will come that will need to build places to meet upon the corner of every street. Because uh, there will be so many people wanting to be in the church. We'll need to build them. And people will no longer even uh, need to drive to church. They'll just walk to church because of the number of the sound churches teaching pure doctrine across the earth when Satan's deception is at an end, when he's bound, when he's cast into prison. Children, you can think of the deception of Satan as like a, an eclipse of the sun, where the moon comes for a time in front of the sun, and it covers the earth in this, this grayness, this darkness for a time. But when Satan is bound and cast into the prison and sealed, it'll be like the moon moving out of the way and the light of the sun coming through. And the nation's will see the brightness of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is, this is what we anticipate. When we think about this thousand-year time, we say that there will be things needful to take place ahead of this time in preparation for it. But this is what we pray for. Do not imagine that Christ will return physically and set up a kingdom on this earth where he will continue to do battle with his enemies for a thousand years, uh, gaining ground, losing ground here and there. Do not imagine that. Christ's humiliation is ended entirely, and he is glorified. When he comes, it will be once and for judgment, and all shall be raised at that time. And also, do not content yourself with this expectation of the amillennialist who may be optimistic about these things and may have much agreement with what we've said, but can't be too sure that these things will happen to the extent that we've said. They can't be too sure that they might, they, they, they say these things, they might happen secretly. They might happen spiritually uh, out of sight. Don't be contented with that especially when thinking through all the things we've read in Scripture, all the glorious things we've read in Scripture. Uh, who could think that? Who could think that these things are going to happen secretly, out of the sight of men, after reading passages such as Isaiah 60? Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but... The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar. Thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then shalt thou see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged. Because of the abundance of the sea that shall be converted unto thee. And the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The, the multitude of the camels shall cover thee, and the dromedaries of, the, of Midian and Ephah, and all, and, they, and all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, and the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are those that fly as a cloud, and the doves... And as the doves to their windows, surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring thy, bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold, with them unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy upon thee. Therefore thy, thy gates shall be opened continually, and they shall not be shut by day or night." that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought, 
and on and on and on. The Lord says, lift up your eyes and see. These things are all going to happen in the sight of all. These things are going to be well attested to. Not done uh, secretly. Not done even spiritually in the hearts of men, but very openly. All of these things I've been declaring unto you, we could find them if we looked in larger catechism question uh, 191. What do we pray for in the second petition? Answer, in the second petition, which is, thy kingdom come, acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan, we pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed. The gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, the church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances, purged from corruption, countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate, that the, ordinance of Christ, the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins and the confirming, comforting, and building up of those that are already converted, that Christ would rule in our hearts here and hasten the time of his second coming and our reigning with him forever, and that he would be pleased to so ex exercise the kingdom of his power in all the world as may best conduce to these ends. So that's what we pray for when we say thy kingdom come. All of these things that I've been declaring unto you, that Satan's kingdom would be utterly destroyed and he would be bound and that the Jews would come in fullness and that the, the Christ would have dominion from end to end of the earth. Brethren, when these things happen, Satan's deception will be placed on hold. That's a wonderful promise. That's something to look forward to. Satan's deception will be put on, on hold, but that will not be the end of all the trials of the church. You see, his fury will be unleashed once again on the people of God in the final days, in the little season that we read about, the little season. So you see, even in this time of which I've told you, this glorious time, even in that time, all the biblical admonitions stand. That we would watch, that we would pray, that we, we, we would be sober. They stand then as they stand now. Watch, pray, be sober, lest you fall into temptation. Here's what, here's what Peter says, 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. All, all of these things will still apply due to Satan's uh, little season that's coming up. You see, some people disparage the view that I've presented based on, on the fact that we teach that certain things must take place, the Jews must be converted, Antichrist must be struck down, and Christ's reign must extend over all the nations. They say we, we believe all these things must take place before his second coming. And so they say, you people don't believe Christ could come back today. You don't believe he could come back tomorrow. You think it's quite a long way off, don't you? And they say that makes you complacent. Uh, that makes you at ease. Well, there are a number of ways to answer that. The first is to point out that nearly every view of the last things affirms that there are certain things that have to happen before the, the final day. And so there are a number of, of views that would say along with us, well, Christ, uh, it would not make sense that he comes back today. It would not make sense that he comes back tomorrow. So a number of views uh, share this with our own, with my own. Even the amillennialist acknowledge that uh, certain indicators will accompany the end of all things, such as famines and disasters and wars and persecutions and apostasy. And that these things will be for signs. And so you'll find uh, all, all millennialists also saying that Christ's return uh, could be in a short time, but probably not today. But there's another way to answer the objection. There's another way. Uh, we could bring forth three, three parables from Christ. The faithful servant, who the master finds busy when he returns, 
and the unfaithful servant who said in his heart, my Lord delayeth in coming, and so he acted wickedly. There's that, and then there's the king that goes into a far country, and the servants who did well, in the, and they, they, wisely, uh, they wisely stewarded the talents given to them, and then the unfaithful servant who hid it in the ground, and then the, the ten virgins. There were five wise ones who held on to their oil, they had some extra, and then the five foolish virgins who had none. They had none extra, and they were shut out of the wedding feast. In each of these parables, the ones who are commended not only conducted themselves in a way that that was sober and would please the master, if he did come back suddenly, they acted in a way that was sober and would please the master if he delayed. You notice that? Whether he came back quickly or not, they acted wisely. The faithful servant who acted wisely, who, who did not let his guard down. The faithful ones who invested and in, in, who stewarded the talents wisely. And then, of course, the five virgins who held on to extra oil. And so the commendation is, is not just for the one who behaves themselves uh, wisely in the, in the short term. It's for the one who behaves themselves wisely in the short and long term. And you could say in some of these things, it's almost as if the expectation is that there will be a long time, that there will be a testing over a long time. What does the king say in in that parable when he gives the talents to the servants? What does he say when he leaves? Occupy till I come. Suggesting a length of time, implying that there um, there is much work to be done before his return. So we could answer by saying, we are to be sober and vigilant, whether short or long. And plenty of people have gotten themselves into error and gotten themselves into trouble by anticipating a return that was too imminent. And so what do they do? They left their places of employment and they sold all they had and they made predictions and they they lived as though uh, there was no reason to, to plan for the future. And they've gotten themselves in trouble like that. So as we've said, this period is a time that we long for. Things must happen, but we, we long for this period. And there will be also at the end of this period, this little season of Satan where he is loosed for this time. And so all the admonitions apply, whether now or whether then, to watch, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be about the work of the master. Because I tell you that we we see that there will be those who live through this time I'm speaking of, who live through this time of great gospel prosperity, and even they will be caught off guard. When, when Christ comes again. Can you imagine that? Living in a time of, of the prosperity of the church across the face of the entire earth and still being caught off guard? But brethren, this is a danger for us. It's a danger that, that we would be like these that we read of, clothing ourselves in a nominal religion and just being formal about our, our uh, worship of God and our, our, home, our home worship and everything, being formal and clothing ourselves, that's the person that's going to be caught off guard. The one who's not really vigilant, not really sober, not really watching, but instead the one who has lulled themselves into a slumber when it comes to the things of religion. That's a danger for us just as much as it will be even in this time of which I speak. Here's here's an admonition from Paul to the Thessalonians concerning this time. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman's child, a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, 
Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And so that's an admonition for us. All these days, these coming days, will be quite glorious. But the return of Christ, it will still be a shocking time for many, even within the church. And so be as, as Paul says to the Thessalonians, we are children of the day. We are not in darkness that we should be overtaken by this day as a thief. But we are to be children of the day. Walking with Christ in sincerity, loving him, uh, putting away sin, mortifying the deeds of the flesh, and always doing his will, always doing his work, so that we be prepared for the day. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Would you stand once again as we go to him in prayer? O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, thou hast said in thy word uh, many things concerning the, the times to come. Uh, Lord, we admit unto thee that uh, we are uh, slow to understand. But yet, Lord, we pray that we would take hold of whatsoever thou hast shown unto us. We would understand it, that with thy help we would uh, put into practice those things which thou would have us do, based upon these realities. O oh, Lord, we pray that it would be so, even as we have read in thy word, and that there would be, there would be an end to Satan's uh, deception upon the nations, and that there would be a mass conversion of the Jews, that things would, these things would be fulfilled. And, O oh Lord, we pray that there would be, uh, in, a, in, in a, a short time, this, this glorious kingdom, which we have heard about and we read about. Lord, we pray that thou would make us prepared and make us vigilant. We pray that we would encourage one another with these things. And that thou would help us in, uh, in going through this life uh, soberly. Lord, please bless us as we, as we conclude and as we go through the rest of our uh, day and that we would worship thee in it. And please bless us as we go forward into another week. We do pray that thou would uh, attend to our needs and also bring back uh, the Beers family uh, safely along with Abra as well. Lord, we love thee. Please God, forgive our sins, and we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. And now we will be singing to the Lord's praise from Psalm 72. And we'll be singing verses 7 to 12. Psalm 72, Psalm, and verses 7 to 12. The just shall flourish in his days and prosper in his reign. He shall, while doth the, mu the moon endure, abundant peace maintain. And then down to verse 12. For the needy, for he the needy shall preserve when he to him doth call, the poor also, and him that hath no help of man at all. And so in, in between there we also have a number of a number of glimpses of this reign of Christ that is to come, uh, with the mighty kings on earth falling down before him, and the gifts of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom. And so let us sing to the Lord's praise, Psalm 72, 7 to 12, and the tune is St. Lawrence. <clears throat> Amen. Okay. 
in men. There is only help in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand as we receive the Lord's benediction? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.